Okay, happy Friday, everybody. We've got a great show for you today. I'm going to talk to author Max Chafton about his new book, The Contrarian, Peter Thiel and Silicon Valley's Pursuit of Power. The interview gets a little heated. Uh, I challenge him on two very sticky subjects. Uh, the first being, he mentions many times in the book that Peter Thiel has people around him who are white supremacists. Not saying Peter Thiel's a white supremacist, but the people around him are white supremacists. And then the other issue I talk about, well, I'll let you get to that when you hear the interview. But first, I'm going to cover Coinbase's new NFT platform and the blowback they're getting from some recent hacks. And should customers investing in crypto assume some level of risk in their account security? I think so, right? If you're going to be in a situation where nobody's in charge and it's a distributed system and it's easily hacked, well, maybe you should expect that you will get hacked. But Coinbase and Robinhood are both investing massively in phone support and customer support, which is a great idea. Okay, let's get to the show. This Week in Startups is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. A business is only as strong as its people, and every hire matters. Post your first job for free at linkedin.com slash twist. Belay. Get back to doing what only you can do, growing your organization, and leave the rest to Belay. Learn how by texting TWIST to 55123 or visit belaysolutions.com slash twist for a free ebook called Rise Up and Lead Well by Tricia Ciotino, CEO of Belay. And Zendesk. Qualifying startups can join the Zendesk for Startups program and get six free months of Zendesk products. You'll also get access to an exclusive community of startups for advice and connections. Visit Zendesk.com slash twist today to get started. Okay, on Tuesday, Coinbase announced that they will be launching an NFT platform and the waitlist grew to over 1 million users in just 24 hours. So uh, here's the quote from the Coinbase announcement, just as Coinbase helped millions of people access Bitcoin for the first time in an easy and trusted way, we want to do the same for NFTs. Right now, OpenSea is the largest NFT marketplace, if you remember, and according to DAP Radar, a site that tracks decentralized app data, OpenSea had 261,000 users over the past 30 days. So um, that seems like a small number in terms of you know, the overall internet, but I can tell you for an early stage company, like an NFT company to have a quarter million people trading on the platform, that would be a huge number. So I don't know if that 261,000 users actually made a trade, where they visited the site, very hard to tell from uh, what Dapper are saying there. So this is one of the things that's always hard about metrics in our industry, people will say they had users, to me, a user means they're logged in. So are these actually logged in users or when I perused OpenSea, two or three times in the last month, am I counted? Uh, and then were they not just logged in users, but did they actually do a transaction? Because if they're users, that means maybe 10% did a transaction. So it'd be 25,000 people making transactions, and you could actually work and back and forth. Now, for those of you who don't know what an NFT is non fungible token, it's an object, typically like an image or a video, that is a keepsake that could have some other rights associated with it. Sometimes you buy it as a piece of art, Sometimes you buy it to be part of a club and a membership in a club, and maybe that membership will have some downstream effects. Now people are talking about them not just as baseball cards or not just as a membership card, like you're in a private club like Soho House, but maybe it's a uh, has some utility to it, like it's a sword in a game and you use it in, you know, Diablo, but you can take the same sword and use it in Fortnite. Perfect example. And so there is some concept of these NFTs, these objects obviously being tradable uh, on the blockchain being traded peer to peer in an easy fashion and being one of one, and maybe even having rights to it. So my understanding is, uh, I think with the board ape group, you get the rights to your monkey, and you can then make art with it or t shirts, I believe that's the case. Either way, this uh, NFT waitlist means Coinbase is like great companies when they add a vertical It's one of the great things about having scale. Once you hit scale, you can add another adjacent category. You could be Uber and you add Uber Eats or Uber Freight. Now you're hitting the ground running. You've got some amount of users, technology, team, playbook, cash that you can deploy uh, to make it even faster and easier to do the next vertical, 
Airbnb experiences. Eventually, Airbnb, they've talked about having an airline. Each of those things becomes easier when you are Amazon and have books, and then you do DVDs, and then you do home appliances, you get the idea. And so uh, and Robinhood obviously uh, started drinking Coinbase's milkshake and with their 20 million accounts, uh, which obviously I have shares in Robinhood, um, which if you had dinner with me, you'd know in the first 15 minutes. And those Robin Robinhood added crypto, right? So now all of a sudden, boom, uh, crypto has become a meaningful part of what they're doing. So there's a singularity that's occurring. All of these financial products will have margin loans, 401ks, 529s for college, bank accounts, checking, cash payments. It's just going to all be one thing. So Coinbase, Robinhood could eventually be part of Google, Amazon, or Apple, or be the equivalent of those companies. That's my belief. I believe Coinbase and Robinhood are destined to become trillion dollar companies or be a major piece of a trillion dollar company. How amazing would it be? If your Amazon account was connected, or your Apple account was connected to your Coinbase account, and that was, you know, Coinbase was owned by Apple, or Robinhood was owned by Apple, what an amazing future that would be, right? You're, you're using Apple Pay, plus you've got your 401k and your checking and your bank account right here. I mean, that'd be extraordinary. And by the way, I, you know, the Apple watch I hated for a long time, I got the six, because uh, my Fitbit kept breaking, and I was just tired of dealing with Fitbit customer support. Literally, every time I call Fitbit, they're like, yeah, you're out of warranty. I'm like, it's 18 months old. This thing is broken. It just turned off. Like, this is the fourth time I've bought 20 Fitbits. And they're like, yeah, uh, sorry, it's the not under warranty. And then I go tweet it. And I at mention it because I don't get the answer. I want customer support. And then immediately seven people DM me. Oh, I work at Fitbit. We'll send you a new one. And I was just tired of pulling the micro celebrity card on Twitter. So I just bought an Apple Watch and I miss my Fitbit. I'll be honest. I liked it better. Uh, in many ways. But the one thing I will say is that when you double tap this or just press this button, and you can just Apple Pay. Oh, my Lord, I am picking places to go based on Apple Pay because it's so delightful to just go bing, and then get your little alert. I was in Italy, bing, 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 I was just buying shit everywhere. I loved it. And that I think is the future. I think we're going to see Google, Apple, Facebook and Amazon want to own one of these companies or compete with them. And you, you see it with Apple Pay, Google Pay. So it's going to be really interesting. In other news, uh, it's Coinbase world. We're just living in it. Uh, come back on the program, Brian. I want to talk. Uh, in other news, we invited, I know you guys keep asking me to have Brian back on. We've invited him 10 times. We've got radio silence right now. So and maybe I said something. I don't know. Sometimes I'm honest, candid. Or maybe he's just uh, tired of the press because the company's <laughs> doing so well. He's super busy, but I'd love to have you back on, Brian, and chop it up. Uh, in other news, uh, CNBC reported on Tuesday that Coinbase was facing blowback on its new live customer support phone service, which they launched this month. Obviously, Robinhood announced they're launching 24 hour, uh, seven day a week phone support for their 31 million users. Wow, they have 31 million users. Oh, wow. Go Robinhood. According to the article, Coinbase's phone support only deals with customers whose accounts are locked. Uh, this is obviously useful for people who've been hacked and hacking is the big issue. And CNBC this week, I don't know if you heard it, they went kind of all in with uh, stories of people who were hacked who lost all their crypto. And this led to a lot of regulation talk. If this happens at a bank, you don't lose your money. If it happens at a crypto company, sadly, you do. And so if you want to trade virtual money, and you want to be a rebel with your NFTs and not have to report on your taxes and do everything in the gray area, well, don't be surprised when you get hacked and there's no recourse. That's the concept here. It's decentralized. Nobody's in charge. Oh, your money got stolen. Okay, well, why don't you go to whoever's running this decentralized network? It's like, oh, well, it's a decentralized network, Jake Al, nobody's running it. Okay, so you chose, you chose to buy imaginary money. And that imaginary money has no guardrails. You're screwed. Buyer beware. You know, people are taking their crypto and putting it into safety deposit box, cold storage, whatever. If you're going to do this and have any kind of money, you're probably going to want to be get across five different accounts and have it locked. Before we get into the ad, I just want you to go to linkedin.com slash twist right now, linkedin.com slash twist and post your first job for free. What a deal. Incredibly supportive uh, of you, LinkedIn, to give that free job to our listeners. And you know, small business owners are busier than ever. The time spent searching for and interviewing wrong candidates, let's face it, bad candidates, 
takes away from growing your business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs has made it easier to get the candidates worth interviewing faster. And they're giving you your first job for free. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach the world's largest professional network of over 770 million people. Use screening questions to get your role in front of only the most qualified people, then quickly filter and prioritize who you want to interview and eventually hire. We love LinkedIn Jobs at launch and inside. And in 2021, we've hired a third producer, a curriculum designer, and a few more researchers. And we're doing all that hiring on LinkedIn. We love it. And we're still hiring. So here is your call to action one more time. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right candidates worth interviewing faster. Every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn. So post your job for free, free, F-R-E-E, at linkedin.com slash twist. That's right, linkedin.com slash twist to post your first job for free. Terms and conditions do apply because we're giving you something for free. All right, let's get back to this amazing episode. And obviously, there's a steep learning curve here. So, you know, if you have a phone support like Coinbase and you have to take phone calls, I mean, you're going to be on the phone for hours. It was like the PC companies in the early days, like, you know, I'm Dell and I'm doing a phone support and you're calling me about Microsoft Word problems. And it's like, well, we're not Microsoft Word. And they're like, my computer's not working. It's like, we made your computer. You're using software. Like, that's kind of where crypto is. People might have a problem with their NFTs or their Dogecoin or Ethereum. And it's like, this isn't Coinbase's problem. And we're not here to take all these calls and spend an hour on the calls. But what I would say is uh, you're there's a lot at stake in these accounts. So of course, there's going to be thousands of people getting hacked all the time. Uh, And according to a Reuters article from October 1st, at least 6000 Coinbase customers had their accounts hacked between March and May of this year. That's just a couple of months. So it's a big target. Uh, Coinbase explained that the issue says unauthorized third parties exploiting flaws in their SMS account recovery process, the hackers then access accounts and install crypto. Coinbase spokesman said, uh, we immediately fixed the flaw and have worked with these customers to regain control of their accounts and reimburse them for funds they lost if they lost it from that specific hack. There are many other hacks, obviously. This is where some reasonable amount of regulation will have to come into play. And it'll be great for Coinbase, uh, for Circle, for any of the legit players, this regulation is going to drive more customers and more lock in. Because if there was a need to um, have like FDIC insurance for if people lose their money kind of thing, and and say the first 100,000 of your crypto is uh, guaranteed to be protected, that would drive people to use these services and create more lock in. Uh, So there's a bunch of uh, bumps in the road like this. It's just part of running a company. I know it's really, if you read just the mainstream media, you know, they have a very anti tech bias right now, because tech has stepped in it a bunch of times and tech is a lot bigger than it was, we don't have to relitigate the entire uh, mainstream media versus the press. Some people believe it's because like, you know, Bology believes it's because the mainstream media is losing to Facebook and Google. So therefore, they hate the tech industry because they, you know, drank their advertising milkshake. I don't buy that as much as I think tech has gotten really big. And People are woke now. They they're socialist. The, the climate in the country is anti corporate for whatever reason, and I think the media is reflecting that in a large way. In fact, they're hiring people who are anti tech or who you know have an axe to grind with tech. I mean, even the New York Times is hiring people who are you know explicitly anti tech who personally attack tech leaders you know in vicious personal ways because it's how they feel, which is fine. But I mean, it, it really is creating this sort of mistrust in the mainstream media when they cover stuff because all companies that are growing have problems high scale companies that grow have problems i mean you saw this with rental car companies you've seen it with hotels you've seen it with cable companies if you grow really fast aol you're going to have bumps in the road Um, really i judge all these companies by how quickly they resolve the problem how quickly they take action and if you look at coinbase look at Robinhood. Man, they they realize they got a problem with customer support, and they are going all in on it. They're going to spend tons of money, hire tons of people, and they're going to look at their call centers as a way to build trust and to grow their businesses. And that's the right move. In fact, when I interviewed the founder of JetBlue, David Nealman, um, and I actually had him on the cover of uh, one of my magazines back in the day, he um, he said, "You know, Jcal, we had all of our." We had all of our contemporaries with call centers in India and uh, Manila and the Philippines, whatever. And 
there were cultural barriers. People didn't like talking to people with accents uh, at the, you know, if you remember that time period, it was, you know, a little bit xenophobic, but also there was just lost in translation moments. He said, I am hiring people work from home, uh, moms and dads in Salt Lake City in the country, basically, and we just tell them they have to have a separate room with a closed door. They have to have a T1 line or whatever DSL, you know, and we'll pay for it. And then they get to work whatever shifts they want. He basically created the gig economy. And um, that's why JetBlue was so loved because he told everybody like uh, Tony Shea, rest in peace from Zappos that those were times to bond and learn and to create a connection with your customers. And I think that's what Coinbase and Robinhood will learn is that the money they spend, yes, it's going to reduce their profitability. But long term, it's going to build customer loyalty. If you can talk to your customers, my lord, get on the phone and talk to them. And if you can talk to them when they have a problem, oh my god, even better. Because that's a chance for you to turn it around and turn them from a detractor on the uh, net promoter score to uh, a promoter, you want to get them from being a detractor, they hate you, not just to being indifferent, but to being like, Oh, my God, you ever have that customer support experience where the person was so good that you're like, I'm going back to that restaurant, they comped our desserts. And uh, they gave us a free after dinner drink. Oh, my Lord, the, the chef came out and apologized and explained the problem. Oh, I love that restaurant. Like for me, that's the greatest I, I as I get older, like just seeing flawless, amazing service to me is so inspiring. That's what I've been working on with the syndicate.com actually and, and trying to actually bring here to this week in startups with the meetups. I want to do more high touch stuff where we get to meet folks. That's why I'm doing the noti gang and the live streams. I was like, podcasting is strange in that you have you produce it you distribute it and there's just no connective tissue like where's the connective tissue like we never built into the podcasting standard comments like why aren't there comments in podcasting shouldn't that be a standard can somebody ask dave weiner to make a standard for podcasting where any podcast episode in my feed you could comment and there's a second feed of the official comments so there should be a way to link each episode to a comment thread that the podcaster controls on an open standard. And then if you're on Spotify or iTunes, it's the same RSS feed of comments. What a brilliant idea. Why doesn't that exist? A common comment thread. And then if you post it from Spotify, it would authenticate your Spotify account and you would be a Spotify user said something. Could somebody build that and put it into the open standard. Just think about how great that would be if people could put comments, you know, or, you know, at minute 52, I could post a comment, man, that'd be incredible. I mean, I know it could be chaos too. But uh, so that's, I think one of the things any great business leader entrepreneur learns when they're running these businesses is, yeah, don't hide from your customers, like run to the customers, not away from them. Okay, so now let's get to this uh, little dicey, edgy interview I do with Max Chapkin, who is the author of a interesting new book, I, I wouldn't say great, but definitely interesting, The Contrarian, Peter Thiel and Silicon Valley's Pursuit of Power. Uh, we get into it. I challenge him a little bit specifically on his repeated claims in the book that Peter Thiel is white supremacy adjacent and that Peter Thiel has a affinity for young, attractive men. And it gets a little heated, a uh, little challenged, but he was a great guest and I very much enjoyed the book. Uh, and I know people in Peter Thiel's uh, orbit do not like the book. So it's a great interview. I might be getting a little blowback of why I did this interview even in my personal circles. We'll see. Stick with us. For so many leaders, there's a moment in your personal and professional life where you realize you're in your own way. Yes, you're the blocker. You know you need help. And that's exactly where Belay comes in. But delegating your bookkeeping to someone can be intimidating and scary. Imagine, though, how your business would transform if you didn't have to worry about producing reports and balance sheets, if you had more time, energy, and focus to work on things that only you can do, like your product or hiring. You could achieve bigger goals because you have the freedom to focus on what matters. Belay, the incredible organization revolutionizing productivity with their virtual assistant service for growing organizations can help you. That's why they're giving our listeners a free download of The Cost of Not Doing Your Bookkeeping. Your finances are not the place to be experimenting, holding your breath, fingers crossed, and hoping for the best. So if you're ready to wave the white flag on handling your red and black margins, let one of Belay's experienced remote bookkeepers help. Get back to doing what only you can do, growing your organization, and leave the bookkeeping to Belay. 
Just text TWIST to 55123 or visit belaysolutions.com slash TWIST for your free download of The Cost of Not Doing Your Bookkeeping today. All right, next up on the program is the author of a new book, The Contrarian, Peter Thiel and Silicon Valley's Pursuit of Power. Uh, I just finished the book. And the book moves briskly uh, through lots of the well-documented life and career of an obviously quirky teal, somebody I know, not personally, uh, but somebody I know all the people around. So it was a unique read for me, having known 90% of what's in the book. uh, And it goes through all the obvious stuff that we here in Silicon Valley know, the Stanford Review, PayPal, seafaring states, the teal fellows. Investing in Facebook, creating Palantir, these are all efficiently chronicled by the author Max, um, which really catches the audience up on what we here in the technology industry witnessed up close and personal. Um, And the book starts building its case that Peter Thiel is brilliant, dangerous and powerful. Uh, And maybe even that he's a white supremacist, or maybe dabbles near that line. And maybe um, the author dips into his being enamored with young men uh insiders in the tech business will probably laugh at the uh contrarians overestimation of teal's power uh while new york's media circles and the woke left will salivate at some of this positioning uh but in the final act the author shifts from what we largely know um and that's been recycled from some uh, of the known sources of information from gawker to the books written about paypal and he hits some really new information, uh, and certainly was new to me, uh, and has broken some news. And that's the section where he talks about Cambridge Analytica, Rand Paul, Trump. And you start to learn that maybe a lot of what we witnessed with Trump was, uh, should have been or was predictable in this path that Peter took from the Stanford Review, uh, being bullied as a little boy, uh, for being smart and a nerd. Uh, all the way up until his, what I would consider his Icarus moment, supporting a nationalistic candidate, um, and then maybe using the insights and data that he gained as an investor in Facebook to put uh, the most polarizing, unqualified president in the White House in history, uh, or at least help. Teal hasn't uh, become exactly irrelevant in the technology industry, but he's no more no more influential or powerful than the other dozens of billionaires here. He's just a lot more quirky. And the book really does a great job of catching people up on that and then showing where it eventually wound up. So uh, welcome to author Max Chafkin. Thanks, Jason. Thank- wow, what a what an intro. I mean, I feel like you've given me, uh, you know, several things I have to uh, push back on, but uh but uh but but really appreciate it. Really appreciate reading and uh yeah, excited about the conversation. So, let's just start with the uh you know, obvious question. Why uh is this your first book or have you written yeah, books? Yeah, before? yeah, it's, it's my first book. book. So, why did you pick Peter Thiel as the subject of your first book and something that I'm assuming you spent 3 or 4 years working on? Yeah. Um, well, so, so I'm really interested in the story of kind of how, um, Silicon Valley became what it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and when I, I mean like this, you know, it went from, you know, being important and culturally relevant, you know, in the 1990s, but but kind of like a sideshow still, even during the tech boom to being, you know, I would argue, um, the most important economic center in the world. Um, the most important cultural center in the world. And um, maybe it's not quite the most important political center in the world, but it is, but obviously it's becoming more relevant politically um, than, than it was. And, and the story of how does, how does this kind of outsider industry um, become so important in our lives? Um, and that's, you know, that's anyone who's been covering tech, right? Like that's the story we've all been writing. And, um, you know, just when I was thinking about um, you know, who's been involved in that story, I think Peter plays a big role, right? Um, as you say, and I totally agree, there are other people you could, you could sort of tell the story of Silicon Valley through somebody else. Um, and there have been like these other very important figures, but, but I think Peter's trajectory is pretty unique and pretty interesting. You know, PayPal, um, I think even people who know about it, even people who talk about the PayPal mafia, I think they kind of underrate um, just how influential it was, not, not in terms of I mean, of course, it's influential in the ways that, like, you know, it's how people move money on eBay, and it's this big, valuable 
um, payments platform, but I mean in terms of creating um, kind of a playbook uh, f- for like how startups are built. Um, and I think, uh, and, and I think so. I think Peter is really important there. I think he's really important in um, Facebook. You know, one of the defining companies. Um, you know, maybe the defining company of, of the last um, twenty years. Um, you know, uh, uh, Peter and Elon, of course, have a have a complicated relationship, but. Um, but, you know, that relationship has been really important to, to both them. And I think, you know, it's hard to imagine SpaceX, like I think SpaceX, you know, maybe probably succeed, would succeed if, if Peter hadn't invested in it. But um, certainly would have. Yeah. But but he played a big role in, in, in making sure that at a very difficult time in kind of the, the business trajectory of Elon Musk when during the recession stuff, you know, he was there. Um, I think Founders Fund um, just played this a huge um, not just in terms of, of finding important companies, but in terms of like articulating kind of an intellectual case for mm. um, startups and a very specific kind of, um, you know, startup building philosophy. I think same, you say the same thing about um, zero to one. And so I, I think like all that just by itself, right, would be enough to justify a book because he's an important figure. And but why did you pick him? What, what is it about well, him that well, made me, you interested? Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. So I and and so but then there's then there's what happened in 2016, where um where where Teal, who is as I said this important figure, um does something that I think people probably who knew him weren't hugely surprised by, but the outside world was surprised because you know how does a venture capitalist, somebody who's you know obsessed with the future, obsessed with you know um bringing about change and a very specific kind of change, end up endorsing you know, um, uh, basically reactionary and how does, how does an immigrant, you know, uh, get behind somebody who's running a candidacy that's basically a nativist candidacy? Um, how does, how does a gay man, um, get behind somebody who's from political party that has, has been super hostile to, to gays and lesbians. And I think there's like a really interesting and, um, and complicated story you can tell, but like that, that contradiction I thought is really interesting. Right. And I, like, I'm somebody who is interested in, in kind of in those kinds of contradictions and and that's what drew me to it initially and as i dug deeper you know i do think that you know for all the reasons i articulated at the beginning peter's important but he also saw something that was pretty pretty important with trump even if you can disagree with the with his you know decision to support trump but he engaged politically at a time when i don't think as many people in, in tech were engaging politically I and mean, he was kind of ahead there too and i think even if you regard the trump thing as I, as a, you know, it sounds like from your intro, you do as, as a disaster, uh, you know, huge mistake or something. Um, I think you have to also agree that it was kind of brilliant in a way, um, as an investment. Um, and, and so anyway, I, I think the combination why would it be of, brilliant as an investment. I mean, it's basically made him a pariah in the tech industry. So why oh, would it be a brilliant on. investment? No, I, I, I don't think it's, I think it's certainly, well, it, when I say that his business is investing in companies and uh, nine out of 10 founders who would have taken his money before supporting Trump, I think wouldn't. I mean, people, uh, of course, you definitely hear that. But but I mean, people are still taking his money. I think that well, um, it's not just that I hear it. It's that I'm one of the most active investors in the world. So I see it. Yeah, you yeah, know, I, I, I look, yeah. I, I, I respect the point of view. I'm just saying, I think if you look at his net worth, if you look at um, it, how his companies have done, you know, d- in that time, um, uh, he's still making a lot of big investments. Um, maybe they're not the same investments that he would have made. You know, I just think it's like a, it, it, this might be the one thing that and we'll get to, obviously, um, like this seems like an interesting jumping off point, because I think that's, you're a New York media guy, right? Like, uh, worked a fast company, you're a career journalist. <laughs> yes. How old are you? Uh, I'm 39. 39. So you've been around, you actually remember the dot com boom. You were graduating high school at the time or in yeah, college. Yeah, man. I was reading yeah. Wired and, uh, yeah, you know, I uh, remember it. So it, it's just a very interesting to read your perspective of it as an outsider or a journalist from New York versus being here in it. Um, because I did think it's, inc- I was actually very impressed with how accurate the stories are, having witnessed them firsthand from, you know, the Stanford stuff into PayPal, I, I think all of that you nailed. I think this like, concept that he is extremely powerful and influential was the part I was like, huh, or that people were scared of him. Um, you mentioned in the book that people feared him. Uh, and I'm curious where that came from, because I think over since before Trump, slightly before Trump, he became less relevant in Silicon Valley because he was less active in actually investing directly in companies. Uh, and 
you know, had kind of handed off Founders Fund to Brian Singerman and, and the crew over there. Luke obviously had left to start his own fund. So I think his kind of power base, he kind of gave up, right? So do you, where did you get this um, perception that he's feared in Silicon Valley? I mean, I heard it from many, many sources. Um, and I think... Um, Curious, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, can, I can understand that somebody like yourself... Um, yeah, I don't think you have a lot to fear from Peter Thiel. Um, uh, but I think if you're a startup founder, um, uh, people, there is a perception that, you know, uh, that, that sort of breaking with, um, you know, that, the, the sort of PayPal mafia consensus, um, uh, either on politics or in some ways on tech, you know, makes you difficult to fund. Um, and I, I, I recognize, like, I, I think there are people, and I talk to, you know, former uh, Teal fellows who kind of explained to me, uh, people both who disagree with Peter's politics and those who agree with them. And, you know, I, I, I heard how Teal fellows kind of have to navigate it, right? Because they recognize that some invest, some potential investors um, don't agree with Peter and don't, you know, would never, you know, invest in his companies. Um, but I do think there's enough of a kind of conservative community, um, even there, you know, even in the belly of the beast, um, where I don't think he's quite the pariah that you're kind of painting him to be. Um, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say pariah. I, you know, I think you, the, the number of investors in Silicon Valley is so great that, you know, one investor just really doesn't have any sort of lock on it. Even Sequoia, even Kleiner Perkins, even Andreessen Horowitz, the scale of Silicon Valley is so much different today that it's not like, uh, the small circuit it was. You know, which you describe with, you know, um, right. Zuckerberg going to Peter Thiel instead of going to rule off, you know, and uh, going to Sequoia. At that time, yeah, it was a small circuit. You know, there were a dozen firms you probably would take your consumer startup to. Now it's 1,200, you know. It's, a, yeah. it's literally 100x. Zendesk is the go-to tool for customer support. And they also offer a suite of tools designed to remove the difficulties of sales software. You can get access to Zendesk's suite of sales tools, plus their industry-leading support software, free for six months as part of Zendesk for Startups. You'll also get access to Zendesk's community of startup founders and partners and dedicated onboarding guidance and support. Here's a little testimonial from one of my portfolio companies, Steezy. They sell software to learn how to dance. Steezy uses Zendesk Explorer and their ticket tagging system to track which features their users are most excited about. Then they relay that info to their product team, which is just brilliant. For Steezy, Zendesk creates a positive relationship with members and it empowers them to contribute to Steezy's growth. So here's your call to action, the old CTA in the business. Get six months of Zendesk for startups free at Zendesk.com slash twist. That's right. To qualify, you must have under 50 employees, have raised a Series A or below, and be a new Zendesk customer. What a great deal. You can get that six months of Zendesk for free at Zendesk.com slash twist. Start building an amazing customer experience at Zendesk.com slash twist. There, there seems to be this um, repeating accusation and or insinuation in the book that Peter is either a white supremacist or likes to hang out with white supremacists or people who've previously been white supremacists. Let me just say, ask you outright. Do you think Peter Thiel is racist and a white supremacist? Uh, I don't think he's a white supremacist, and the book doesn't say that. Um, no, I and think, it clearly it doesn't, right? I didn't say it did. It's yeah, just, yeah. It kind um, of says, like, this person was a white I supremacist, this person was previously, and he, he seems I, to... I, Chuck I, Johnson, I, he's next to them all the time. Milo Yiannopoulos. I think Yiannopoulos. he has, um, you know, at various times in his career, um, associated himself and chosen to associate himself with really provocative people, people who are deliberately poking it in the eye of the system. Mm -hmm. And, and those people have, um, and this goes all the way back to the Stanford review and the diversity myth. And, um, you know, and I think in, in, in many of those cases, right, there's, there's two ways to see it. And, and you can either see, um, some of these things as free speech stunts, um, or a, as something more insidious. Um, I think, um, like I said, I don't think, I don't think white supremacy is a big part of his ideology. But he does seem to be at least comfortable enough with it that 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 like, you know, that these that he's not worried about these kind of slightly trolly or provocative things. Uh, and and, you know, he's definitely 
Um, yeah, I mean, it comes he, up six or seven times in the book, specifically around South Africa's apartheid in the uh, early days, which I didn't actually know uh, so, that story. Yeah, uh, maybe I mean, you the, could tell that story. And, and does that feel it, to you to because so what I, I took see, away oh, yeah, from the book ahead, is ahead. after the six or seven mention of it, that you were kind of saying, listen, he's 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 white supremacist adjacent, right? Uh, which maybe I, I, I is think, just the people around him are, you know? Yeah, I think, I, I, I mean, I think he is definitely at times kind of played footsie with some very radical ideas. Um, I'll, let me speak to the, to the South Africa thing, because uh, to me that, I mean, I can tell you the story, right? Yeah, and tell it, us the and, story, because I don't, this is a story you actually talked to the woman who was the principal in it, right? Th yeah, there are two, um, there are two uh, people who have accounts like this, one of whom uh, is, is, on the record in the book and one of whom has published a, a medium post um they're both you know i think very credible um the the medium poster you know is a very successful you know stanford graduate was a longtime stanford administrator um you know i i, I but, but let me just say a couple of things here um peter Thiel had a very unusual childhood um he he moved around a lot and you know he's talked about being an outsider and he was an outsider right not just not not just because of his um, sexuality, not not just because um, his parents are German, but because they moved all the time, right? And they lived. He did live in South Africa and Southwest Africa, which uh, now modern day Namibia at the time was a um, you know an apartheid state. Um, and um, I don't think that makes him somebody who defends apartheid or anything like that. I do think that probably coming to Stanford. Um, in you know the mid '80s, and I remember in the mid '80s, apartheid was a huge issue on college campuses. Yeah. It was like the defining um, sort of like left-right issue. And I think um, Peter's talked about this. He's you know he's talked about feeling like you know basically on the outs at Stanford, right? It's he's at this very liberal institution, and I look. I, this is not I'm I this is my read on it, but I imagine that some of those apartheid protests may have felt very personal, you know, mm. and and. Not because, not necessarily because you are agreeing with it or something like that, but because, it, you know, it's just your fan, you know what I mean? Like, I think it, I think there's a possibility that, you know, it, that, that, that might've contributed to the, to the, to the personal nature of it in the same way that if you were born in South Africa, you know, and a white person, you might take it personally, even if you weren't trying yeah. to like. So um, tell the maybe it would be yeah. helpful here to tell the story of what happened specifically because he yeah, had some. Yeah, so, so pretty there were. You charge the, comments about apartheid. Yeah, yeah, the 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 anecdotes they they both amount to um, black women at Stanford who um, had heard that Peter had very extreme uh, politics and who confronted him about apartheid. And I think it, it was kind of going around that he was you know he, he spent time in South Africa and Peter made a comment or, or made comments to the effect that and I don't have the, this in front of me, but I'll just yeah. summarize. You know, it's it's an economic system and we shouldn't meddle with the economic systems of you know other countries. Now, look, I, and first that of all, the black people in South Africa were doing better than the black yes. South African countries that were run by black people. And I, like, I think that these comments are abhorrent. Um, Teal yeah. has denied them um, and uh, or said he doesn't remember talking about them and that he um, he did not support apartheid. Right. Um, I think um, I think if you look at what else was being written, not not by Peter Teal, but by like the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Like those comments are not as far outside of the mainstream as one might imagine they are today. I mean, this was like this was like a pretty common thing that right wing people were arguing at the time. So yeah. so I don't think it's actually as crazy as like, you know, having lunch with Milo Yiannopoulos or whatever. I think it's I think it's I think it's actually more, um, you know, more of a piece of a time. And I think right. it's important to talk about that stuff. Um, you know, and, 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 you How know, did the black women, the two, what you said it was two black women who you talked to, who responded to what was there, or one of them, I guess you read the blog post or one of you talked to, you talked to both. What did they tell you about those situations and how they felt? I mean, they told me that it was horrible. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it, I mean, no, it's, I, I think, and I think that's the part of the story that, that, uh, prompted them to talk to me, prompted them to speak publicly mm -hmm. because of course. It's not just a political statement. It is a statement when you're when you're making a statement to a black person who's in front, who's a human being standing in front of you, yeah. right? That 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 is that that has a personal quality to it. Yeah. And and I think that was the that that was what was upsetting. Mm. Um. And I think um, 
like I don't think first of all as I said he's denied it I don't think you know one or you know even a couple mistakes or whatever should define somebody's you know life or beliefs and and things like that um uh but I do think that you know it, you know it speaks to a to kind of where he was at the time yeah. which is somebody who was um you know pretty political and really committed to um you know political provocation and I you know again if it, he even if those stories aren't true, I think that assessment, it, you know, is true. Um, but, I, and I should say, I do, I believe the stories. Yeah. I mean, at that time, it's people who were from South Africa were pretty sensitive about this issue and the transition they were going through in South Africa. And a lot of the people in the West were saying, we're not going to play Sun City. And it was a, a very big cause celeb at the time where literally every rock musician was saying, don't go to South Africa. So it was a pretty charged anti it wasn't just anti-apartheid it, it, i think it felt to people in south africa of anti-south africa and so yeah. maybe there was a little bit of that if this in fact did happen uh the quote from the book maxwell said she was taken aback as he explained matter of fact that the country should not be held to more the moral standards of american students without any point acknowledging that maxwell as a black woman might find this offensive he said it with no affect recall maxwell this is possibly the creepiest thing about it um and you go into that affect a whole bunch um, and then you also talk about, hey, with the um, PayPal group, it was all men. Um, and then it was this sort of uh, insinuation about, uh, hire, you know, surrounding himself with a lot of young men uh, in the Peter Thiel fellows. That was something that also is mentioned, I think, four or five times in the book, this, uh, you know, surrounding himself with attractive young men. What's the... I mean, I'm not, there's no, that, that, that's not an innuendo. I mean, it's just okay. an observation. Um, okay. I mean, I think Peter, um, has like an intellectual type and it's like a, a, a like hyperverbal, um, super provocative, uh, man who is from, um, an elite background, but who's willing to like criticize those elites and like, also you young and good looking you say in the book. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, okay. I think it's. I mean, you know, like, I think the, the, the archetype here is like Josh Hawley, right? Like Josh Hawley is like classic kind of like kind of guy, I think who, who, um, would appeal to somebody like Peter as like a, as like an intellectual, I'm not talking again, not, not speaking sexually here. I'm talking about as somebody who he thinks has a, has an impressive platform, et cetera. You know, Hawley is, you know, handsome, kind of all American good looks, hyper verbal. And yet, and from, from these elite institutions knows how to talk the, you know, knows how to talk that, that lingo. Um, and also of course is totally willing to just, you know, jab it in their face. And I think that's the, you know, that, you know, that's the, it, to the extent that he's interested in influence, like that is often the, the vector that you see for influence. Some people believe that the gawk, the gawker, um, instances kind of cracked Peter or tilted him to a certain extent, maybe got him off his game and maybe was uh, when he stopped being focused on investing in startups and maybe got more, I don't know if I say off track and, and you seem to sort of chronicle that. And I remember that very well as well, since I took some hits in Valley Wag <laughs> uh, qu quite unfairly and they were lying scumbags. So, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm sort of curious you as a media guy, how you feel about gawker itself and if yeah. you think gawker was you know what what was peter right about gawker because yeah. i know the media and i listen i i'm a unique case here because i started as a new york journalist i'm a new yorker who worked in media and then i'm living in the valley and i know i'm not friends with peter i've probably yeah, hung yeah, out with peter have five times mutual friends though. but i have a lot of mutual friends around him obviously absolutely and so my, i'm wondering your thoughts on gawker itself you personally do you think gawkers as a publication um crossed the line too many times and that it was virtuous for him to go after them or do you think it was um, absolutely horrible that um a billionaire could shut because th the view of the new york media is it sucks that in a billionaire tech person can shut down uh, a publication um and then the view of anybody who was subject to gawker or value Wag is well they're lying and they're attacking people and they're posting revenge porn so these people should go out of business absolutely. what do you think personally yeah. so um well, I, I just want to push back on a couple of things there just real quick. Um, number one, 
I actually don't think it it pushed him off his game startup wise. I think it pushed him off his game hedge fund wise. You know, like that. Oh, was, that's true. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It coincided with the kind of breakup of Clarium, and um, I actually think it may have pushed him more back towards the kind of like the startup world and away from the hedge fund world in a way, be, partly because the the whatever the the fund didn't do well. Um, the other thing I want to say is um, I, the characterization that the media um you know, loves Gawker or something is totally not true. I mean, basically media people, most of like elite media people hated Gawker, right? Because it went after them all the time. And when you saw the Peter Thiel thing, um, there were lots of famous journalists, like, you know, basically applauding. Uh, so, so like, I don't think, I, I, again, I, I, it's, the media is, is definitely not a monolith on this. No, definitely not. Um, personally, and, and especially at the highest levels of the media, the, the media people who really, really matter, like they were sending Peter congratulation emails. They weren't, they weren't sending him fascinating, uh, yeah. uh you know, I, I, I like, you know, and they and, were giving and, him the well done. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So what do I How think? How do you personally? think about it? Yeah. I'm yeah, sure, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so I think, author. I think a lot of what Gawker published, um, was abhorrent. Um, and that was in journalism and would by the standards of 2020 not be considered journalism and would not be published like i'm an editor right at at, at bloomberg and and i would not let somebody publish um you know peter Thiel is totally gay people um for lots of reasons right um but but i think you know the the um the idea of of announcing to the world somebody's sexuality like before they're not ready to do so um, is not cool. It's not something we should do. And it's not a very good defense to say, well, he was out, uh, to his coworkers and to his friends. Right. Because like, that's a different situation. Um, I also think Gawker did some important journalism and I think sure, that, yeah. that, um, at the time, uh, there, that they were right about certain things. Harvey um, Weinstein. Yeah. Uh, not just, no, and not just about like the, Me not just stuff. about that kind of thing. I'm, I'm saying like they were, um, covering, uh, Silicon Valley as a power center before most people really realized it was a power center. And they were right about that. Um, and, and, and they did. And as you said, there, there was some good journalism. I think basically like, look, I, I think, I think that smart people can kind of disagree about, um, whether Peter was right to feel aggrieved enough to like, you know, take, take legal action against Gawker. Um, the, where, where I start to feel uncomfortable is the um is like the secret campaign by a billionaire to destroy a media company uh through this kind of backdoor uh, totally brilliant i think you got to respect it from like a you know kind of gamesmanship like peter is an excellent chess player like he wow. had his people he funded a group of people to look through every story on gawker and valleywag find the aggrieved parties and figure out which of those cases were viable flood the system with lawsuits i think maybe he did five or six well um, it's never been exactly clear how many he funded you'll see in the it. book it's pretty careful because because we don't actually know right like how many he funded and how many he incurred there's there's a sense i think that he maybe encouraged some but may not may not have actually you know anyway the way um, he explained it to me yeah was i am funding it for people who have no recourse because yes. if you were unless you have over 10 million dollars $20 million to sue Gawker. Gawker can keep lying about people and Gawker did lie about people. Gawker can keep posting revenge porn. They posted revenge porn. They could out the CFO of a giant media company for being closeted and having a uh, uh, tryst allegedly with uh, a male escort while married. I mean, you remember this long list yeah, of yeah, horrific things it, they course. did. Yeah. And, um, and I'm dancing around the specifics. Um, but uh, he said, I'm doing this for all of them and myself because they shouldn't exist. Is there any validity to that argument to you as a media guy and well, the author of this? I mean, I, I, I mean, I understand the argument. I, I just think that there's a very strong argument on the other side that, that by doing it, you create a lot of problems if you want to live in a free society. Mm -hmm. And, and the problem is that um, once this has been done and, 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 and more than just doing it right, I think part of the, problem when you're talking about like incentives is the way he has talked about it since including kind of bragging about it talking about it like i was this awesome thing um you're creating a permission structure uh permission structure um for other billionaires to do the exact same thing how many times has it happened since 
Well, we do, I mean, it hasn't happened, but we don't know. And and there have been no, lots you would know. There'd be a lawsuit. We would know. It took eight years for this thing wow. to. It took eight years for this thing to percolate. It hasn't been. No, no but has there been a publication that I mean, has there have been tons? I can tell you for a fact that there have been more. There are more pre-publication letters now written to news organizations than there were before. Um, Charles Harder has gone on to a very um, successful career doing this kind of thing. Now, now again, each of, in each of those cases, I think you can talk about the specifics and, and I don't know, like, you know, he sued the Daily Mail um, uh, over some, you know, these, this coverage of Melania Trump, which I think was pretty, pretty terrible. Um, so, so I don't know, but there definitely has been. Who's um, that guy again? Charles? What was his last name? I forgot. It. Charles Harder yeah. was the lawyer. Harder, who, yeah. 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 Who represented hogan and who has you know kind of um, which they won by the way right like they uh, won it hands won. down easily well, and that's and that's kind of why it was such a brilliant um sort of chess move because they found this case where like it was so clear cut and 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 they had a jury in tampa hulk hogan is from tampa they had like you know there's just like no universe where where like they could lose that case and yeah and and you can totally see why the jury um found the way they did because because you know, they're being asked um, a very narrow question. And, um, and it's pretty clear that Gawker had done something wrong. And, um, but, but I think that it has, it has long term um, implications that are, that are bad. And I think, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm afraid that, th that it was partly kind of by design, because the, the goal of a case like this isn't just to publish to punish um, Gawker, it's to send a message to, to anyone who might be tempted to, how many um, times did Peter do this before Gawker added him? How many times did he do he it? Sue a publication I mean, into oblivion. I, I mean, I don't know. Not, the hopefully none. Zero. Yeah. How many times uh, has he done it since? Again, I don't know. Hopefully yeah, none. Well, how I mean, many? I mean, the answer is zero. I can tell you. I <laughs> well, can tell the point you I'm that, pushing back on this is because yeah. I think media people like to put up this, you know, uh, united front of like, oh my god, this has a chilling effect. But the fact is. This would never happen at Bloomberg. This would never happen at the New York Times because New York Times wouldn't print revenge porn or out people um, yeah. or otherwise lie about them or invade their privacy. So I think it's like maybe a circle of the wagons of the media, which listen, I'm part of the media. I get it. But I also think Peter Thiel, I, I think that what you nailed in your book, uh, and I'll give you credit for, on this one explicitly because I, I witnessed this because I know Nick personally. I know uh, I don't know Peter all that personally, but you know, obviously I'm around him. Um, and, and specifically talk to him a number of times about this because I was attacked by Gawker many times. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I competed against Denton with Weblog Zinc. So I know him personally. And, and I'm actually considered myself kind of friendly with Nick. Would go to lunch with him any time and have. Um, you know, I think that what you nailed is this is a story of uh, two gay men who had two different perceptions about being closeted. And right. a third gay man, Owen Thomas, who was as he told me having his own struggles at the time, who was going absolutely insane writing crazy stuff for Valley Wag, a lot of which he now regrets. Um, and that really is the beginning and the end of it. Like if Peter didn't feel so strong, if if Denton didn't feel so strongly about outing people and the hypocrisy of being gay and closeted in 2010, whenever this happened, 2008, 2010, I can't remember the exact date. Um, and Peter hadn't been so scared of losing his Saudi LPs. This really was about the end game of, you know, being gay in American society in some ways. So, yeah, I mean, and I, I think that I, I want to say two things. I mean, one is, you know, as you've kind of hinted in all sorts of ways, um, the book, um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a journalistic book and I think it's fair, but it, it's critical at times of Peter. And, and I made no secret about that when I was working on the book and I didn't, I was never threatened by, um, by Peter or anybody who was purporting to represent him. You know, he didn't make my life easy, but he didn't try to stop me. And, and I think to, you know, to the, to, to your point, right? Like that's not something that's, that, that is to his credit. Um, uh, and, and I think, um, it's good. Uh, I also know that you know talking to sources right they know about this they they talk about gawker right because you know peter is a very powerful guy and and while like you have articulated like a very clear ex like explanation of like why he did this and why he's never going to do it to anybody else he would never do it to bloomberg like it's not necessarily clear to a whistleblower um that that's the case and we're talking about somebody who now 
you know, has a great deal of power, you know, for better or worse. And I, I just think it's, it's not a great situation. And maybe, maybe, maybe it's fine for Peter, right? But it's not a great situation when we've created a, basically a playbook and a permission structure by which any billionaire um, can intimidate, um, uh, you know, free media. And, well, and, here's a way it, for free media not to get them in trouble. Don't print revenge porn. Of course, but 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 I again, mean, that's, like, this is where your argument breaks down so perfectly. Like you're kind of making this into, you know, like Peter Thiel is going to do this to all journalists, and journalism's got this existential crisis. If journalists don't break the law, they right. would not be sued out of existence. The end. And you know, and I approached this. I did the book, obviously. You know, yeah. I'm not. You know, it has. Are you scared of Peter? <laughs> People keep asking me that, and I keep saying the same thing, which is, yeah, but I'm scared of every billionaire because anyone <laughs> could do this thing. No, I mean, you know, that's that's the truth. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, like, I'm not a billionaire. Like, I don't know what the, you know, what, yeah. how, you know, and and I think like my and I have a big institution behind me, right? Like, I work for another billionaire. Uh, yeah. So so um, so you know, I, I obviously have, and I and I'm published by a major publisher. Like, there are a lot of reasons why I don't. I, you know, why I wouldn't be afraid. But but I do think, um, I think it's really important that people are free to talk to journalists. I think like what is happening with this Facebook whistleblower is really important to our society. And I worry that if you get too many, if you get another gawker, um, whether it's Peter Thiel or somebody, or Rupert Murdoch or whoever, um, that, that you're going to start to erode, you know, freedom in this country. And if we erode freedom in this country, we, you're going to erode freedom in the whole world. So I think it's not a good thing. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, let's go on to um, what's ha what happened at Facebook, I think is super critical. Um, the Cambridge Analytica stuff, uh, all the way up to Jared Kushner and the relationship with Trump, um, I think is the most interesting. Let me ask you, knowing what you know, you spoke to hundreds of people for this book, I think? Yeah, Over 150 uh, yeah, people closely connected to Peter in one yeah. way or another. So knowing what you know, do you think Trump would have been elected? Or what, are the, what is the percentage chance Trump would have been elected if Peter had never supported or gotten involved in the 2016 election? I think he increased Trump's chances, like in a real way, but not like it's not like he doubled Trump's chances, right? Uh, I think it was like, a you know, 10%, 10%, something uh, like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my view is um, that when I, and I heard, I heard this talking to people in the Trump world, right? Peter was very valuable to them because, of course, all billionaires are valuable to politicians. Um, but, but Peter was especially valuable to Trump because Trump did not have kind of like business credibility. Like, say what mm. you want about Peter, right? Like, I mean, he's controversial and he was even controversial before the Trump thing. But he has like a certain amount of cred that is like a little bit more than like the average Trump world person. So like if yeah, you remember, I would say that's an understatement. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm being very kind now. Okay, <laughs> you're so, being pretty like, kind there. Remember the RNC, right? It was like Chachi from Happy Days and like a bunch of real estate guys. Some of whom it was were a indicted. shit show. It was, I mean, and like like half of those guys are like have been indicted or would be in, anyway. Um, and then it literally Peter is a clown car. It's like it's it's the grifters and the washed up criminals. We'll do a 10k speaking gig for any you know Russian affiliated you know, syndicate. Right. <laughs> I mean, and then you have this like serious, very serious venture capitalist who is really respected, respected yeah. by people like me in media. Like, of course, Peter has his, you know, there are people who don't like him in media. But, He's but, legit. Like, yeah. And so he was valuable to them. And, um, for that reason, and that like, that's why he had the like prime time speaking slot on the last day of the RNC, the day, you know, when Trump spoke, um, I think that that speech um, while he might have been a little uncomfortable with talking about his sexuality, I think it was like a really important, um, I think it was an important moment in the Trump campaign. I think it was an important moment, like in the history of America, um, I, I, like a really cool moment, um, frankly, where because, because the, a gay he, man spoke at the yeah, and scene. not just because he spoke, but because of the way he was received, right? He was applauded. They, there was a standing ovation. You go back to the last RNC when, it, um, when somebody, uh, a gay person talked about their sexuality on stage. And like half the convention was like, you know, taking their hats off to pray, you know, for the, uh, for the, for the guy's soul. Right. <laughs> so like big change from that, yeah. you know, from one to the other. And, and I think like in, and, and, and having, and the fact that it was Peter, somebody who has not been super comfortable, you know, he's not like somebody who's like wearing his identity on his sleeve. I think all of that made it very powerful um, and powerful, you know, both for Trump voters, but also probably for, um, you know, independents mm -hmm. um, and some Democrats, you know, D Trump, a lot of Democrats voted for Peter. I mean, for Trump. Um, 
But but the really more important thing I would say is, um, if you remember October, Access Hollywood tape comes out, right? Yeah. At that point, Trump's candidacy was not looking good. It was like, were Yeah. All the, like, a lot of mainstream Republicans were backing away. The donor class is, like, nowhere to be found. And, and the two things happened, one of which is, like, WikiLeaks, right? And I think that probably helped Trump a lot more than uh, Peter Thiel. But, but I think Thiel coming in, making a, you know, $1 million plus donation, a pretty big donation, you know, in turn, in, as, as far as these things go, and giving a speech where he kind of tried to contextualize, you know, and put into context the remarks, to defend them, essentially, where he didn't, he didn't defend Trump for saying, you know, grab him by the pussy. But what he said was, hey, you know, we got to take this guy seriously. Yeah, he has some, he, you know, seriously, not literally. That was, that was the teal catchphrase. And I think, um, you know, that was, uh, that had some influence. And it, and in terms of both like changing the news cycle and, um, I agree. And uh, so, so I think, I think all that made like a, a, a significant difference. I don't know. Again, I think Trump, uh, you know, there were a lot of things that went well for Trump and, and I'm not sure he maybe, maybe could have done it without Teal, but it was a very close election. So, um, it does seem like Zuckerberg, um, has been influenced by Peter Teal in an outsized way. Peter obviously liquidated his Facebook shares. He doesn't think Facebook is the most important company in the world he's been pretty clear about that yet um he still seems to have his ear and he seems to have walked him into the white house and created a pretty um a chummy relationship and it, it does seem like zuckerberg's taking a page this very week maybe even yesterday when we're taping this over uh from trump's playbook which is never apologize go on the offensive attack the messenger which is what they're doing with the facebook whistleblower today so what do you think the impact Teal had on Zuckerberg is? Obviously, Teal had a big impact on Sean Parker, a friend of mine. Um, yeah, who obviously had a big impact on uh, Zuck. Do you think Zuck is actually a Republican? Do you think he actually voted for Trump? Do you think he's uh, more aligned with Trump than, say, Hillary? I think that or Joe Biden. Um, okay, so I don't. I think that Zuck's politics are pretty hard to parse i would guess that he, you know um his politics seem to be uh facebook uh, it's like uh facebook is, 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 is political view yeah. um share price uh, <laughs> but i do think um but i do think that peter has had a really important influence on him i mean i think the business influence is very clear right like you can see the ways and zuckerberg has talked about this the ways in which kind of teal's um view of building startups had an impact on facebook and i think you see in the kind of Facebook, like move fast, break things like that, that spirit, I think comes to some extent from the, the PayPal mafia. And I think you could even, you're probably going to think this is a little crazy, but I think it's not like, I think you can draw a line by some of these, from some of these provocateurs that Peter has been around to Zuckerberg. I mean, Zuckerberg mm. in, is in his own way, not all that different from like, you know, Keith Raboy or something like he's, he's like sticking it in the eye of Harvard. Remember, you know, he was, he was fighting yep. with Harvard over this um, you know, whatever the precursor, or not, basically, yeah, yeah, the, the the Facebook precursor, and like he's totally like another one of these kind of like you know bad boys, right? Like, and I and I think I'm CEO, bitch, is a card, one hundred percent, yeah. So I think there's that, and I think um, it's pretty clear that oh, okay, so maybe not pretty clear. It's like clear as mud that he has somewhat he has some pretty libertarian views. I mean, we've seen some of them come out, and basically in terms of the way he thinks about um you know, speech and like, reg like, what is Facebook's responsibility to society? I mean, it seems like he basically thinks that the answer is none, um, or, or something close to none. Um, and that it's important to, to take that position in order to maintain freedom or, or, or something, something along those lines. Like, I think that is, um, probably has a lot to do with Peter's influence. Um, uh, and, um, as you said, I think that Peter played a really important role kind of in the Trump era with, with Zuckerberg. So, um, Zuckerberg, if you go back to 2016, right, he was getting hit really hard over this like kind of mini, this is like a really stupid story, but like it was a big deal at the time, the trending topics thing. Yes. Where they had like created this little sidebar and no one was even looking at it, right? But like it, but, but it got spun up into a big to do in conservative media. Um, and conservative media, I think rightly sense an opportunity here to like, you know, in kind of like the classic sort of Breitbart, like let's 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 try to move the Overton window kind of thing to to sort of after Facebook and say that they were um, going you know discriminating against conservatives and um, 
that became like politically very salient. Um, you, you know, and, and that would have been really bad for Mark Zuckerberg because Donald Trump, as we know, is like not averse to like sort of meddling in the business world to, you know, you know, to, to, yeah, he, he likes to shake cage, just swing a bat. He's, exactly. He takes everything personal. And, you know, there are people in, in Trump's world who are talking about some like very extreme things, um, with respect to tech. But Peter helps arrange this kind of peace summit in 2016, where you had like Glenn Beck and a bunch of other well-known conservatives. And they make peace The you know, Zuckerberg says, Black pack. Yeah, Zuckerberg says, uh, it, it, to me, it's, um, you know, it, it, it isn't the kind of far right, right? It's like mainstream, you know, like uh, Glenn Beck is as far right as I think it maybe yeah, Glenn Beck's was a little there. wacky. He, I think maybe right. had Ben Shapiro there. Which, no, um, but no Breitbart. Um, no uh, Breitbart, no Milo. Right. Who's so, that weird character with the beard you go into a bunch of details with? Uh, Charles. No, Charles Johnson. No, Charles Johnson. Um, I thought that was a very interesting part of this. We'll get to that in a second. But anyway, they uh, do that summit. They kind of yeah. make peace. And then they start showing up on the trending list. And now they were on the trending list too much. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so um, there's this kind of, um, there's this, whatever, there's this kind of peace accord um, where Zuckerberg kind of says, hey, you know, I'm for free speech. And you have like Glenn Beck does a, you know, post saying, you know, Facebook's okay, man. Um, and, uh, this is, remember, fa Glenn Beck was like really going for like reconciliation at that, uh, during that, during that time. Or um, relevance. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, um, but, but, but so it, th I think that helped. Um, mm. and I think there was, and I think that probably influenced, you know, Facebook's reluctance in 2016 to mm. really kind of figure out what was going on on its platform. I mean, you know, there, there are lots of other possible explanations and I think, you know, with a company like Facebook, it's a mistake to like see any one, you know what I mean? It's probably like three or four different things at once, but I think they had, there, there was definitely political incentive to like let stuff go on on the, on the platform. And then I think, you know, going into 2020, like, I don't know who Zuck voted for, but I think he was way more afraid of the Democrats than he was afraid of Trump because Trump had been very good to Facebook for the most part, right? Facebook Absolutely. had been growing. Um, yeah, like Trump every now and then he gets on Twitter and says something obnoxious. But but um, Zuckerberg obviously has a good friend uh, and and board member who's in the kind of in the inner circle, and um, and Trump hasn't really done anything to face. Yeah, that's he, that's where taking Trump seriously, not literally, actually applies. He could say right. whatever he wants, but what is he actually doing to break up big tech? The only thing he really did was say, "We're going to kick TikTok out. You better find a deal." And that set in motion that whole Oracle, Microsoft. You know, we got to find a deal for TikTok. That actually was the only thing he did against tech that had teeth. I mean, Jeff Bezos would like to bring up a couple of things, but yeah, I mean, you know, there's the, the I mean, Jedi deal. Actually, oh, the Jedi deal, yeah. I mean, that was a big deal. I like again disputed yeah. and, but, but uh, I think some Amazon people would would uh, would beg to differ. But uh, uh, and we could probably come up with some other other things. I mean, you know, there. I think in general, Google was more closely scrutinized um, during the Trump years than um, it's still given a pass. Apple given more, a huge pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It hadn't. Uh, well, it seemed like maybe if Trump had been reelected, they were starting to build to there was like cases built. I don't know. It, it seems like maybe there might have been some something going that that could have happened um, if Trump hadn't been and uh, hadn't been reelected. But um, or sorry, if, if Biden had won the election. But uh, but anyway, so I think it I think I think the association with um, with with Teal helped Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. And I also think it helped Peter. You know, I mean, I think I think being that power broker um, between Zuckerberg and Trump, two of the most powerful people in the world is like a pretty good place to be. And it's pretty clear that they don't, that he and Mark Zuckerberg do not see eye to eye. Uh, and yet, um, you know, and yet he's still on the board. And I think the reason he's on the board is because he creates, um, you know, value for Mark Zuckerberg by being like the conservative on Facebook's board. Also would be a huge scandal if, if Zuckerberg wanted to fire Peter Thiel, like, can you imagine like the cancellation, you know, I mean, it'd be uh, a little thing. prisoner's dilemma there. Um, yeah, and for like Peter, that. I think, you know, it, it, I think I'm, I'm sure there is a combination of there's probably some loyalty, right? Uh, you know, personal loyalty, even even if he has, um, you know, even if he has mixed feelings about the company, right? Like, you know, they, they do go way back. Um, and I also think like it's a it's a pretty important position he has. I mean, he he very few people have any influence over Mark Zuckerberg and Peter has some. Cat Charles Johnson is an interesting one. Um, I actually had him on this podcast and I turned the episode off when I realized he was a white nationalist uh, or a scumbag. Um, I had interviewed him because he was doing a lot of interesting technical stuff. And I thought the researcher was like newsworthy kind of moment. 
Um, not that I'm endorsing it, but I just thought on a journalistic basis, it's be, I'd be interested to hear this uh, kid's take on it. But then I saw him doing that white privilege sign and everything. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm turning that. I literally turned the episode off because I was like, I just don't want to even give this kid any air. Uh, but from your book, Charles Johnson, an increasingly influential figure associated with members of the young alt-right, the movement was at once trollish, silly, and dangerously extreme. Members of the movement flirted with racism, even Nazism, anything to provoke liberal outrage. Uh, and he seems to have had Peter's ear, ear for a couple of years there. Um, who is this character? Is he important? Uh, does Peter still associate with him? Because he seemed to be a pretty dark character. So, yeah. Um, so Johnson, as you say, was this, uh, was one of these, you know, provocateurs. Um, he has, you know, pretty much moved away from, you know, he's, you know, renounced the alt-right. Um, he says he's a Democrat now, um, says he's a Biden supporter. Um, I think really? he, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you maybe haven't got to that in the book, but it comes. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, he, I think, was somebody who was um like a lot of these teal figures right like like ha very successful at kind of you know at, at these kind of crazy pro provocations and i think um he was an entree to that world to the to the alt right movement which like was very important i think and and helped propel um uh, help propel trump to to office um and, and, you know, kind of grew out of, I would argue, kind of grew out of the Ron Paul movement. And I think, you know, that's, that was the, the role that, that Johnson played, um, at least initially in, in, in Peter's world. You know, and, and I think, um, you know, he doesn't, Peter does not have like a traditional, like political shop. It's, it's changing, right? But like, he doesn't, he doesn't have like a, you know, like a DC guy, a Beltway guy. Um, uh, but, uh, and so, so I think there was kind of an ad hoc approach. Um, and, you know, Peter has invested in a couple of Johnson's companies, uh, Clearview oh, really? AI, Clearview uh, AI, I've had the founder yeah, which is an interesting, um, which is an interesting one because, you know, Clearview AI, uh, Facebook does not like Clearview AI, right? It's pretty weird, um, that a Facebook board member is an investor in, in this company. Clearview um, AI scraped every image of people off of Facebook, Instagram, whatever, put them into a database and then allows police and law enforcement to search for those individuals doing a reverse image search episode 1100 of this podcast. If you want Johnson has a, has another company. Uh, it's a genetic, uh, genetics company. Uh, uh, he told me that Peter is an in investor in that one as well. And that's a recent one. Hmm. So, so they've continued to have, um, at least some contact, um, you know, in the, in the, in the last couple of years. Uh, but my sense is that they're they're they were more, they connected more over, you know, kind of the alt-right and the Gawker stuff. Johnson was another, um, another person who felt aggrieved and maybe this, I, you didn't bring it up, but it may have been part of why you connected because, because the, because Gawker had, yeah. had written this, this kind of like satirical, uh, post they defecated all kinds of, on the floor, yeah. floor and, and, and Johnson, yeah. you know, sued them. And, and, um, and Johnson, as I talk about in the book, um, was involved in, in this campaign, uh, to go after Gawker, including, um, helping to kind of round up, uh, you know, a lot of these alt-right guys were involved in the Gawker thing, right? Like, mm. uh, Cernovich, um, they were, they were cheering on Peter, uh, yeah. and, and, and some they were of that was basically like surrogates and like amateur researchers is I think how I would describe them. They're on Twitter, you know, advocating for this. So they're creating, you know, some kind of groundswell amongst that constituent while trafficking in information they get in their DMs to kind of help be these like internet sleuths is, is how I would describe it, I think. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think like the whole, like the funding mechanism of the alt-right is, is not entirely clear. There's another Peter associate who was, who was pretty involved in the alt-right, this guy, Jeff Giese, um, who again, he's another one who has kind of um, moved away from some of the, the you know, whatever, the, the sort of most extreme parts of, of the alt-right. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, the alt right also post Trump, you know, it got a lot scarier than it was when, um, you know, d during the election, right? And I think, and I think um, Peter, if he were going to defend himself, uh, would sort of say that basically, you know, it, it, he he wasn't, he did not embrace like the the worst parts of the alt right. As I say in the book, he, you know, uh, of course, Richard Spencer, the the you know neo Nazi, Nazi. Yeah. was involved in this movement. He tried to get a meeting with Peter. Peter did not meet with Richard Spencer. Uh, right. So for there's a line, worth, right? He, yeah, he does not want to exactly. 
meet with an actual Nazi, but these folks would, you know, they were adjacent. This is kind of how I described it at the beginning of the pod, and I think that's probably still accurate, which is, you know, Milo Yiannopoulos is next to Richard Spencer, Charles is next to Milo, and then Peter's hanging out with Charles, and maybe, I think you mentioned maybe he met with Milo Yiannopoulos once or something. Yeah, I think he met with Milo, yes. Um, yeah. And he was definitely, you know, having dinners with people who were involved in the kind of, in this kind of like activist movement, both in terms of this sort of online uh, Trump thing, but also, you know, some of the kind of a a tech activism that was happening in conservative circles, you know, around James Damore. And, you know, we've seen, uh, any anyway, I, I think there was a, a sort of a, um, a universe of kind of people and, and a movement that, that he was, you know, whatever, at the margins on as a, as a sometimes, but most sometimes a patron, but mostly, you know, somebody who was, you know, just being encouraging or something like that. Peter sat with you for an hour for the book or something you mentioned? We met off the record, yeah. Off the record. While you were writing the book or? Yeah, yes, yes. And you had met him before that? Yeah, a couple times. I mean, um, uh, like I said in the intro, you know, he was, he's around every deal that like, I mean, I know you're pushing back a little bit on this characterization, but I, I do think he was around, um, you know, one way or another around a lot of the, you know, kind of important stuff that was happening. Um, you know, I, I think there's probably between our two positions or like the East Coast position of his footprint here, you know, ha I could understand the perception being larger than it actually seems because he's larger than life and he's vocal. And then there's other people who are incredibly quiet and never, you don't even know their names because they've made it a secret who they are and they invest literally a 100 times as much money a year as he does. And there's a dozen people I could mention who put to get put to work a magnitude more than Peter in many, many more companies. So nobody here is really scared of him. But I think that that's a New York perception or a media perception largely. And the people you mentioned who might be scared of him, like, yeah, the Teal fellows or the people in his orbit, he might have an undue influence on. So I could see that actually. Um, it's just maybe not as much in the day to day of Silicon Valley where a founder is, is working on stuff. But it, to that point, um, how did he feel about you writing the book? I know he didn't participate well, I, I, in the I fact checking share yeah yeah i don't want to share any details from uh whatever from the from the off the record conversation um my sense is and well i'll, I'll say what's the point what wait let me just ask this what's the point of the off the record for you just to make sure you're not completely off base and there's something oh no i mean i want like, what does the talk off to me the, record the record do for you i know but what does the off the record do for you it's just that if, if you can get it you take it as a journalist yeah, I mean, so well. And what do you hope things. to accomplish in an off-the-record discussion? Well, I mean, number one, right? Like, I wanted him, and like, still, right? Like, I still want him to talk to me or other journalists, like, on the record. Like, I think, I think that he's, um, you know, he's he's he, he he's very secretive, of course, and you know, he doesn't do that many interviews. When he does do interviews, they're often with very friendly, um, friendly people. You know, people. Yeah, who are, my pot. Yeah, I do. <laughs> ideologically uh well, you're, anyway um he i'm ideologically he, the opposite but yeah sure he, i understand what you're saying he would do he, most favored nation yeah yeah exactly sits. you know and 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 i think whatever that's his prerogative as a uh as a rich guy who can command an audience um uh but i was trying of course was trying to you know i want to talk to him on the record i think you know it's it's always first of all it's it's really good practice like uh, journalistically and i think like you you definitely want to hear from the person um and so, so part of the reason to have an off the record conversation is, is to, is to make the case for that in person and to explain, uh, got it. to make, to explain, you know, here's what I want to do. Here's what I think. Um, and you can learn, you learn stuff in that meeting, right? Because like, you're able to ask questions. Um, you know, I, I think, um, and there's also always a possibility, right? That they come back and say, actually, you know, that was such a great conversation, uh, Max that, you know, I'd love to put it <laughs> on the record. Um, but, uh, but I just thought, you know, I, I just think like, you know, it's, it's, it's also very good to like, just meet somebody face to face. Like you learn, you know, you learn something about them. Maybe you don't learn everything, but like you learn more than you would if you didn't go to the meeting. Mm. Um, so, so I would always take the meeting. Um, and you know, uh, and, and, and of course I was disappointed that he didn't want to talk to me on the record, but I, you know, I understand. And, and I knew, you know, from the beginning that, you know, that it was kind of a toss up and. Um, and, you know, had, as you said, at the end of the process sent, um, had a, had a long, uh, sort of back and forth with his, uh, you know, PR guy where I presented like all the fact checking questions, you know, very long list. And, uh, yeah, he said he didn't, um, he didn't comment. Um, and, uh, I think, 
I think that's cool. Uh, I feel like, you know, in some ways, uh, of course, I wish he'd talk to me and there's, there are questions I really want him to answer. I hope someone will get him to answer, even if they're not me. Um, but I also think that like, he's got, he's got his platforms. And um, if you want to know what Peter thinks, like you can buy his book. It's a really good book, Zero to One. And you can watch his speeches. And, and, and I did. And, you know, that, that's, that, of course, informed the book. And I, and I tried to, you know, use his words w- wherever I could. Um, uh, and I also think sometimes, like, asking someone a direct question is not necessarily the best way to, to learn, learn something. I mean, if you ask somebody, like, how do you actually get stuff done or something like that? You know, sometimes some people are very good at, like, uh, articulating an answer, but other people aren't, especially people who are kind of introverted, um, you know, kind of like Peter. So, so I, I feel like, you know, I don't think it's not like, I think the book is better for, um, for not, you know, having him on the record. I wish he was on the record, but I also think, you know, it's a different story and it's a story that I still think is valuable. How do you deal with just a uh, author to author? How do you deal with people wanting to be off the record? Um, and then knowing that what they're telling you is accurate and not an ax to grind because somebody like Peter obviously has a lot of ax grinders out there since he's so polarizing. Yeah, I mean, you have to you have to do it in the in and in the way you would do it in a normal situation, which is uh, look for corroboration, um, explore motivations. Mm. Um, people often um, take notes or, or you know have have uh, nowadays, right? Like they have text correspondence and things like that. So so you know, often there are ways that you can um, you can corroborate people's memories, and and you can corroborate people's memories by um, by talking to other people. So it's the same, I mean, you know, it's, it obviously involves a lot of human judgment the same way if you were just in a private capacity, like talking to three different people and, um, and trying to figure out, okay, well, what, what actually happened? Mm. Uh, you're a fan of his, do you think he's a good person? Well, I tried to not. Cause a lot of people, uh, you know, feel the book's got an, you know, I, I should say a lot of people, a lot of the reviews, um, or, you know, some of the feedback has been. Yeah, you've got an axe to grind. I don't know that I buy that necessarily. The the two things I felt were weird in the book were the six or seven mentions of white supremacy from his childhood all the way up to the people he's associating with. And then you're constantly mentioning young boys who are attractive or young men, I should say, not boys, young men who are attractive, which I felt like you were insinuating, not pedophilia, but in a proclivity for, you know, of age young men is the way I read it. That you were trying okay, to well, sort of that you were trying to insinuate something with that that like he's trying to surround himself with good looking men and you said he did have want to have good looking men around you but for me for a different reason like he wants the iconoclastic outspoken ones but um, are you do you consider him like a force for evil in the world and you don't like him do you feel he's just a fascinating character I'm curious if you yeah uh, have an axe to grind do you have an axe to grind <laughs> I guess it would be the way I would say it as blatantly no. as possible no okay, okay. Uh, yeah. You know, first of all, okay, I want to push back a couple things. Number one, uh, book's gotten a lot of great reviews. Uh, yes, the from Amazon, media people in the yeah, yeah, I know, uh, on the I East know. Coast who yeah, the enemy. I know, I got it. Go- Gawker, <laughs> okay, <laughs> who um, hate that what he did to Gawker? You know, so, yeah. there are a lot of Amazon reviews that are like, you know, the 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 uh, subject is like cry more, and the only comment is beta journalist or something like that, and it's like seven people found this helpful. You're like, okay, well, thanks, yeah, I know guys. the reviews on Amazon okay. are a little bit. That's why I'm so, asking you personally. Like, do you? Uh, have an axe to grind so you could okay. say i'm giving you that opportunity to say no i don't have an axe to grind yeah <laughs> so i don't and and i i went into this a lot of people say like oh do you like him or not and like I, i've tried to withhold judgment because um i want I, what i wanted to do in the book is cut through the mythology right there's a lot of people who see him as this like ayn randian superhero there's a lot of people who see him as this like evil right wing um billionaire who's you know whatever I, and i think like the there are there's truth in both of those stories and i think um but both those stories are really incomplete and they they not only sell peter short but they sell everybody involved short i don't think it's like a really great way to i think people should be more should think critically uh, even about their heroes and i also think people should look at even people they consider villains with empathy and and there are aspects of peter's worldview that I find deeply that disturbing. What's um, the most disturbing one? Uh, I think his views on democracy are the one thing that I would like to have. Like if I had an interview with him, like that's what I would want to ask him about. 
He kind of believes democracy doesn't work, right? And that authoritarian or a benevolent dictator is yeah. a better approach. Right. And that's the thing. So you, you talked a lot about white supremacy. Um, and I, I do think it's, it's worth pointing out that he has had some associations with some people who've made problematic statements and things like that. But I think he's what he really is, is like a techno supremacist, right? Where like, mm. it's this idea that, you know, the world would just be better if it were run by like some kind of like CEO king. Um, and capitalists, and, basically, like founders. Whoa. It's kind of Ayn Randian, right? It's kind of objectivist. Like, yeah. And let's um, let the builders build and, and then is, let everybody else stay out of the way. Yeah. And this is where, I mean, some I don't of the disagree way, with that. I don't and, disagree and, with your assessment of that. I do disagree with that. Yeah. Um, and, and like, you know, one of these characters, you haven't brought up, brought him up, but one of these characters who's kind of dabbled in white supremacy, who I think is one of the more disturbing of Peter's associations, this guy, um, Curtis Yarvin, who is, um, you know, he's started a company that Peter was an investor in, a Teal, co a Teal fellow co-founded this company. Um, you know, he has dabbled very close to the edges of, you know, of some really dark stuff. And, you know, he thinks that we should replace our democracy with an American Caesar. And that is that 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 idea is taking off um, in a lot of circles. A lot of circles where Peter runs. Um, mm. A lot of people that he is, you know, close to are pushing that idea. And I, that idea, I think, is really worthy of interrogation. And and like personally, I do not like it. Um, I believe yeah, no, in the constitution. I, I'm, I'm going to go with you that I'm a fan of democracy as well. And so, if you dovetail it with the Trump presidency. Um, you many would argue that that was you know he was acting autocratic or authoritarian at times and the fact that during the january 6th uh insurrection or protest whatever you however you want to frame it um he was literally trying to overturn an election so there's a straight line for you teal backs trump trump loves teal trump did not want to leave office after losing the election i mean it's not so far fetched what you're saying well, and so, so like, and to me, that is an important question to ask because I think like Peter has had a big influence in lots of other ways, right? Like, I, I think there's a, there's a really important business story. This is kind of a business book mostly. Um, and, but, but, but the, but the potential, it's a little, it's a little worrying when you look at somebody like Mark Zuckerberg, who has, I think, you know, more power than almost any other human being in human history. He's been really influenced, um, by, by Peter in, in business respects, um, I think in some political respects, and I think it's worth asking, like, do you believe in democracy, Mark Zuckerberg? Do you believe in democracy, Peter Thiel? Because um, those people, because because they're making important decisions. And and I think it's possible, you know, uh, whatever. I, I think I think it's worth knowing the answers to the question. I think it's worth asking those questions in a critical way. And I think one way to, like, ask them in a smart way is to try to be, like I said, to try to just, like, Try to accept the things that are good about somebody and be clear eyed about the things that that you don't like. Yeah, the uh, the white nationalist associations, um, you know, if you're going to be part of that alt right, they seem to have. It seems like the precursor to the alt right was the Tea Party. And then you had on this other side, white supremacists who kind of joined the alt right. And it's some kind of weird amalgamation of people who are conservative and upset with society in some way, um, whether they're incels or Nazis or whatever, and unique brand I, of scumbags. <laughs> I don't want to keep coming back to this, um, but um, but you know, the, on the white nationalist thing, I don't think Peter's a white nationalist, but I think he no, saw not, some yeah. of them as as useful, and I think you know you got to like there's a choice there and i'm not sure that's a choice that that i that i agree with well um, i mean to his credit he wouldn't meet with the people who were known right. Right. and then i think one of the things that was interesting during this period because i had known milo yiannopoulos from the blogging days in the 2000s he had copied what we did at weblogs inc and what P what denton did at gawker and created his own like blog network and he was known as being like a cheeky you know, flamboyant, gay columnist. I think he had worked at the Guardian or the Times right. of London or something. I can't remember which one. And he was legit. Like he was a legitimate, if not quirky, you know, thing. Uh, the columnist, uh, provocateur, of course. And then he just went straight grit. I think this was all like some giant grift where they just started making so much money. And, you know, these unknown rich 
alt right people were sending money to them, Bitcoin to them, whatever. I heard Charles, that guy Charles Johnson just made tens of millions on Bitcoin or something, or 10 million on Bitcoin was that somebody told me I bought it early. Mm. But I think they, like watching Milo Yiannopoulos, I was going to have him on the podcast. He was like, oh, hey, J. Cal, I knew you from whatever. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, oh, I'm doing town. I'm doing this new thing. And I was like, okay. And then I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, what, what is this guy doing? Like, he is way out there now. And so it's almost like that Trump presidency pre-election alt-right moment uncovered and revealed who was actually, you know, part of this. Yeah. Craziness. I mean, I think... So, but I think it's important to say that a lot of this stuff is still going on while like like the, the, um, you know, the, the sort of alt-right as we understood it, you know, in 2015, 2016 is basically gone. Um, but there is this authoritarian movement that is very important and, um, and that, you know, you hear, and that is represented, you know, on Fox news and in some of the most, um, I mean, I want to say like the. The, the, it's like in the upper echelons of conservative media and, and, and in the, there is like, it's not, it's not really at the fringe of the Republican party anymore. It's, it's pretty yeah. much the center of the Republican party. And, um, Peter, I, I think is making a play to be that the patron to that, to that movement. Um, and maybe that's because, um, it's like an opportunity or something like that. But, um, but you know, he's like, he's like going to be a major, he is already, you know, a major donor, uh, for 2022. Um, and, um, I think he's seen within that world as, you know, as one of a handful of, of rich guys who could be, you know, a potential donor, basically like, uh, Koch brothers, the way the Koch brothers, um, kind of, uh, ha- like served as, as patrons to, and, and it sort of took over, um, the Republican party, uh, you know, decades ago. And, and, and you had this like hmm. industrial company like industries, um, and this kind of, uh, political project uh that that the this free markets libertarian stuff that 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 really changed the course of the republican party and 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 helped kind of remake the modern gop i think peter is doing something kind of similar um with the sort of trumpist uh republican party where you have this post-industrial it's not a post-industrial company right but like he's a post-industrial guy he's got you know investments in tech companies yeah and he's you know um pushing you know a the ser- hillbilly I- elegy guy is running right Absolutely. Yeah. With 10, yeah. 10 million bucks from, uh, Peter behind yeah. him and Blake masters, who's, you know, been one of P- Peter's like right hand guys is running for Senate in Arizona yeah. uh, with another 10 million bucks. And, and those candidacies are, um, you know, they're, 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 they're running in the Trump lane and, and who knows, maybe, you know, hmm. maybe, maybe they're going to moderate or, and, and it's all, all totally unclear whether they're actually going to win because like, I think there's some question about whether JD Vance really appeals to like, regular people or it's just somebody that like is good at getting elites you know spun up uh but you know they they it's it could they could have a lot of power in the senate uh after 2022 especially if um if republicans retake the senate yeah i thought the uh also interesting in your book was peter's sort of thoughts on immigration um i thought they were more severe than they actually were i mean he was not for closed borders he was for the point-based system that Canada, Australia, and a number of other very reasonable countries go by, which is, hey, if you've got a PhD, native speaker, whatever you could bring to the system, that would be positive. We score up a certain number of points to bring you in. Um, So do you think he's xenophobic or as rational as Canada and Australia about immigration? Uh, I think that his positions on immigration are very far outside of the American mainstream. Um, I, I don't know where that comes from necessarily, um, but I think it's it, it's pretty far outside the mainstream. He's given um, you know money to this group Numbers USA. Um, you know Numbers USA is is it's pretty far out there. You know they're 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 in favor of getting rid of you know most categories of of immigration and and kind of just focusing on um, you know on immigration as a way to like. Uh, you know, basically populate uh, tech companies with uh, <laughs> like like workers who are not paid very well and are you know. Are well, that to, was actually uh, the yeah the H one B visas were a scam for IT companies to get. Um, they were a scam for IT companies to get Indian uh, IT workers to come to the U.S. and then if they don't do exactly the amount of overtime and 
you know, whatever their bosses tell them, uh, they work for half as much, twice as long. And if they get fired, they have 30 days to find a new job or leave the country and they have families. So yeah. you think about it's basically this modern day indentured servitude in probably about half the cases. In the other half, it's legitimately somebody with unique skills, right? So, um, you know, and I think there there are all kinds of ways you do the points thing right the points thing could be done in a very liberal way right where where sure. where it's you know you're not actually um you're not you're not shutting out a lot of people um who we currently are are letting in um and then there's there are ways that you can do it that are that are sort of much more strict um what i can tell you kind is, of the standard i mean the uk new zealand australia canada all do it this way but you're right the I devil's mean, in the details right like well and and i would also argue like I, you know I'm an American. I mean, I, I think um, I think the American system of immigration um, it has a long. It's you know it's different than than those systems, and and I think there are a lot of people who would argue it's one of the things that makes us you know who we are, yeah. and and so so I don't know. I mean, you know, drastically changing immigration policy in a way. You know, I mean, Peter is more hawkish on immigration, I think, than like what Donald Trump did. Wow, I mean, he's he's further really? to the right. Yeah. Um, well, what did Donald, I mean, Donald Trump didn't do all that much. Um, so yeah, no, uh, again, it's back to Donald Trump yeah. saying a bunch of things and then not doing stuff. I mean, right? I think he's further to the right than like your average Republican on immigration. Now, mm -hmm. uh, what he would probably say and what uh, somebody who's defending him would say is like, you know, the Republican party has been totally, like totally taken over by the global, you know, there would be, there's a response to that. But, um, I think he's, you know, he's in the kind of like Bannon, you know, hard right faction of of the republican party on, on immigration the kind of right populist thing which is because in the book you say he was advocating for the point system in that yes in that meeting with uh, uh you know with all the uh, with all the tech ceos um that's when you know but you're saying I, he might have another position which is more hardcore well i mean i like i said i think there's all kinds of different ways to implement that point system mm -hmm. and, and and you know there's a way to do it that feels like it's continue it's like uh, not that different from our current one and one that is much more extreme and i would say you know he's probably would lean to a, a yeah. you know more, more of an overhaul um and you know as, as i i made the point in that in that um i mean i think there's a lot of hypocrisy on immigration in tech you know uh, a lot of companies were um kind of making these public statements about how you know they were all immigrants and you know making these public statements of uh, yeah. opposition to donald trump and they got in that meeting with Peter and Donald Trump and they weren't, you know, they weren't, they weren't making opposing anything, right? They just, they were mostly just trying to make sure H1B would be intact, you know, and, um, and not it, losing half of their customer base. I mean, that was really the fear here was if you were, uh, Zuckerberg, if you were Google, if you were Tim Cook, the, the real abject fear was Trump has divided the country so much. Are we going to lose all the Republicans? You know, for, are they not going to want to use iPhones? Are they going to start a Republicans don't use iPhones? Are they going to do right. Republicans don't use Facebook? That was the fear. I mean, I think it's the the capitalists out here who are in charge of these companies are thinking about the share price and not alienating any customers, which is how sure. the NBA and Disney look at it too, by the way. Like, yeah. we don't want to lose the Chinese customer base by criticizing them. We don't want to lose Republicans in the United States by criticizing Trump. But I'll, I'll just share one more anecdote. I mean, yeah. you know, this is in the book, but, um, you know, Peter supported Ron Paul in 2012, right? And the, that was and the, very interesting. Yeah. 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 And the libertarians that was a great were, part of the book, by the way, because so that was nobody really it. knows that stuff. Yeah, it's really fun because like, first of all, the Paul people were like really excited and then like, and they were kind of disappointed because because like, although Peter, I think, you know, liked things about Paul, like, I don't think he was quite the doctrinaire, you know, Paulite that they had hoped for. Anyway, after um, after 2012, right in the in the Ron Paul world, there was like a, a thought that okay, Rand is going to be the next um, you know the next guy in this movement, and Peter is going to be our big backer. He was the you know really the only rich guy who had supported Paul. Um, and as I report in the book, you know the, Peter gets off the bus. There's other stuff going on in Paul world, but the, but the main thing that happened outside of Paul world is is Rand Paul gave a big speech where he basically broke with the kind of nativist wing of the republican party he articulated a um you know something that was probably tonally a little bit closer to george w bush or something like that he gave he said he said you know we needed you know it was sort of hawkish in policy but he gave the speech and he spoke in spanish he, it was seen 
you know, in the in the world of the right, as to, he went too far. You know, Breitbart was really mad about it, and that's when Pete, Peter got off the the Ron Paul bus. And and it's possible that there was something else. Um, you know, maybe 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 there were other um, calculations going on with 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 Peter and why he wouldn't why he wouldn't want to support uh, Rand Paul. But um, but you know, my reporting suggests that the, the the immigration position, the softening on immigration, was part of it. I mean, I think he's hawkish on immigration. Um, uh, a lot of the country is. It's, you know, probably 25% of the country agrees with him. Yeah. Well, listen, congratulations on the book. It's a great read. Um, and I highly recommend people read it. Uh, even if you know Peter, I think it's a good thing to read to kind of see the uh, full picture. And I uh, wish you great success with it. I hope you get the interview. Uh, I think <laughs> Thanks, be, I'd, be, I'd be very entertained to see the two of you uh, <laughs> talk. And uh, uh, yeah, make it happen, man. Uh, well, anyway, thank you for having well, me. I'm, I'm not a fan. That, like close to him, to be totally honest. I've probably been in the same room with him 25 times. I've probably had a conversation with him a dozen times, maybe. But you know, like I would say significant conversations for an hour or something like that. Yeah. Like, um, and I know everybody around him, obviously, um, best friends with, you know, a couple of his, you know, PayPal folks. So the, you know, the stories um, are very interesting, I think, to, and I think I was like sort of checking like, correct, 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 <laughs> when I was going through your book of the early parts, and then the, towards the end, when you get into this, you know, Ron Paul stuff and Trump stuff, I think, really interesting stuff. Um, well, thanks. And, uh, and thanks for having me. Thanks for asking, uh, you know, such insightful questions. And uh, yeah, hope we, hope we can do it again sometime. Yeah. All right. We'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye bye.